Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to the Neil Before Pod interview segment. I'm your host Craig and I've recently had the chance to talk to Ruth Connell, who most famously played Rowena on Supernatural. Stay tuned to hear her talking about her time on the show, whether Baby was comfortable to sit in, becoming a Disney princess, and the two of us sharing common ground with us being born in the same place. Enjoy. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined on Neil Before Pod with the Queen of Hella herself, Ruth Connell. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for giving me my full title. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has to be done. It has to be done. Yeah, it was six years in the earnings, so I'm very proud of it and I'll take it every time. Yeah, well... <laughs> You had to build yourself up there. You had to get your son out of the way, all that stuff. So yeah, it was hard one. Yeah, so many obstacles, but um, all worth it in the end to have that thrown. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, that red jumpsuit, it was all worth it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how is this whole lockdown COVID situation treating you where you are? Oh, gosh, you know, it's, it's such a mixed bag. Where are you? I live in Edinburgh these days. So. So are you talking to me from Edinburgh? Yeah. Do you know what I just watched? I just watched Shallow Grave. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, because you're asking me how lockdown is going. And usually I get to go home. My uh, mum and her husband live in Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. And I normally get to go home a couple of times a year. And that obviously hasn't happened this year. And so I watched Shallow Grave, which is maybe a wee bit of a sick way to get over your homesickness. Because <laughs> it's <laughs> kind of a disturbing movie. But, you know, I'm watching it. I'm going, look, look, this is Edinburgh. This is Edinburgh. I know that street. I used to live near that church. <laughs> And it's so, yeah, I miss Edinburgh. So, yeah, lockdown's a bit of a mixed bag, including homesickness, I have to say. Yeah, I know how you feel. I haven't actually seen my family since March. So, really? yeah, it's getting tough, to yeah. be honest. Well, my family, they live in either Falkirk, which we'll talk about, or yeah. Dumfries. So, right. not exactly the easiest place to get. Well, some of them aren't the easiest places to get. Well, when we're not allowed, as we aren't just now. Yes. Yeah. And I got introduced to you through Farah. Yes. Yeah, so tell me, how do you know Farah? Well, I reviewed an episode of Supernatural that she was in. She retweeted uh-huh. it, and asked her to come on the podcast, and she did, and we had a really great conversation. Oh, and I adore Farah. She's yeah, she's great. Yeah, She accidentally let slip the name of a hotel that she shouldn't have during the podcast and asked me to edit it out like, at the last minute, which <laughs> I was more glad to do. So. Yeah, if I put any boo-boos in, I'll, you know, hopefully we can do that too. Yeah, well, just let me know. As far as I'm concerned, if you say it, it's fair game, so unless I'm told it's to be removed, then I'll just leave it in. <laughs> but I'm sure it'll be fine. Sure. So let's start with your early life. You were born in Falkirk, just as I was. So yeah. we, we certainly have that in common. So were you in Falkirk? Well, I started off by living in Stennismuir, and then I moved to Karen Shore when I was about 10 or something. No, but were you born in Falkirk Infirmary? Yes. So, oh, yeah, yeah. I was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can still picture it so well. Not from when I was born, but you know, sort of like, like I visited yeah. people there and whatnot. The rundown old hospital that looks like it could be a place that they go to in Supernatural, to be honest. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I have to tell you, Jensen and I definitely have had conversations about filming in Scotland. He loves Scotland. One of his grandparents is Scottish. That's where I always say that he gets his freckles. <laughs> And he nearly got married in Scotland and oh, one of the same hotels is in Scotland. And we were actually, for some reason, I, I, I said something about the Loch Ness Monster being in Loch Lomond. You know, I just was off on a tangent and, and Jensen corrected me and he was like, isn't the Loch Ness Monster in Loch Ness, Ruth? So <laughs> it's just, I was like, oh my God, here I am getting schooled. So and we talked about it, like maybe there could be, you know, some episodes about the Kelpies or... You know, like the Falkirk, which I adore the Falkirk Kelpies. And I always take people and show them the Kelpies. And all the conventions I do in America, I get them to pull the Kelpies up on the screens. But, you know, we talked about that. And um, apart from the travel aspect, I think they were open to the idea. Yeah. Or try to make Vancouver look like Loch Lomond somehow. Yeah. And it's so green there. <laughs> There's things that kind of can just be in a, just a bit of a bigger scale. Trees are just, you know... Everything can just be that a bit bigger. So, but, um, but the rain and stuff for sure can be like Scotland. So, yeah, would yeah. accept it to be fair. Just put some random castle in the background and would be okay. I absolutely, Photoshop that in. And yeah. off the <laughs> so your Wikipedia page says you grew up in Bonnie Bridge. So uh, what got you started down the road to stardom? It was a very, very long road. I grew up on a farm 
outside Bonnie Bridge. My mum kind of did amateur dramatics. My grandma was quite well known in the area, Ruby Connell. She was the only woman in the Scottish Football Association and she helped run Bonnie Bridge Juniors. And she was into opera. And, you know, I'm from a very kind of working class place and background, mm. but also had influences in my life. My grandma would play me classical music. I had watched movies. You remember watching Gone with the Wind, which now is obviously we're, we're talking about it a lot with the BLM stuff going on, how it's not really appropriate anymore. It never was really. Yeah. But, uh, you know, seeing movies and stuff and kind of always sort of having a hankering. And so and what really happened was my cousin, Ruby, who's the same age as me, she wanted to go to dancing lessons. And I got taken along, you know, two cousins going together to keep each other kind of company. And... There's a picture of me, like about four years old, standing, pointing my toe, really pointing my toe and like, ta-da! And kind of sort of had a natural ability for that. And so, you know, was very much performing and dancing and got a part with Scottish Ballet when I was nine. And then I got to play the lead in The Nutcracker when I was like 12, I think. I was playing Clara. And I just so loved being on the stage, being in the company and telling the story and, and sort of feeling like I had a good contribution to make, which I think is the key for everybody, really. You know, you know, everyone has a contribution they want to make. And sort of always having this bug, but also realising, you know, I'm a girl from a farm in Scotland. It seems a bit bananas to say I want to be an actor, because to me that meant a film star or, or something, you know? And so, <laughs> yeah. so kind of went on a very long road for a shortcut by being a dancer because I knew I could do that and then dating an actor and seeing plays at the Traverse and I actually didn't go to drama college to study acting till I was 24 so I was what was called a mature student and <laughs> never look back <laughs> oh, Jesus. but it took me a long time to find my voice to actually I would be confident performing but not necessarily speaking and I have to say that that that's kept going and now with the convention study of Supernatural I found more confidence just in speaking in my own voice. And honestly, doing things like this five years ago, I was so nervous, but kind of gaining a bit more confidence just speaking as myself. So it's definitely been a very long journey and it's sort of a bit of a winding road to try and explain. Does it make sense? No, it makes complete sense. And I totally get where you're coming from because coming from Falkirk myself, I know it can seem like a place that can be hard to get out of. It's weird because everything's relative and it was a big deal. I used to go through to classes in Scottish Valley and drive through to Glasgow and that was a big deal you know yeah. um, whereas in LA you commute 45 minutes everywhere any given moment but it was a big deal to go through Glasgow twice a week and I really appreciated my parents and my grandparents and people doing that for me and it wasn't always easy life wasn't easy it wasn't always the resources and I felt very much I was at St Joseph's at one point St Joseph's primary school in Bonnie Bridge and it was very different to going through to Scottish Ballet you know like I felt like I had a two feet in two different worlds and I think some of the acting comes from having to be able to adapt a little bit and feeling a bit other than in both places but wanting so much to belong in both <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah what about you you moved from you tell me how you got how you moved from Falcon. well I got a day job working just in an office in Edinburgh so I used to commute there for a little while and then a friend said do you want to move in with me? And so I moved and I haven't been back living with parents since then. I've just I've been out my own ever since then, living in Edinburgh since then, which, you know, is great. There's so much at your fingertips to, in terms to do. It is yeah, a completely different world and commuting is not much fun. It, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, the commuting, there was, was it 33 minutes on the train? Yeah, <laughs> the extra three from Haymarket to to Waverley. Yeah, I've done that journey so many times. And Edinburgh, and honestly, Falkirk, as I say, I, I love coming home, and I still call it home. I love Edinburgh. I love showing people Edinburgh. Some of my best friends are still in Falkirk. My dad's still on the farm in Bonnie Bridge, and it's just, I yeah, I I really love it too. You know, I, I adore it. Whilst I also am so happy to be. It was over eighty degrees. <laughs> <laughs> in Los Angeles. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like hell to me. I can do the heat like that. I much prefer it when it's a bit colder, I must admit. Yeah, I don't like it too hot, but it's yeah. nice when the sun is shining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's see if you did a lot of stage work. Is that something you're clamouring to go back to? Or is it something you dip your toe into every now and again, just a bit of no. stage performance? 
I'd love to see oh, this dramatic choice or that dramatic choice. It's honestly what you get offered, when you get offered, what's appealing, what seems doable. I definitely always try to make an effort to do on stage stuff. I think it's a real muscle builder. I think if you can do that, it makes other things easier. And I do think that some of my biggest expansion has come through doing certain parts and certain roles on stage. But, you know, I love TV. I love film and TV. I love the discipline of it. It's more like dancing where you have to be prepared on your own, turn up, be on, be disciplined, pony up. Stand in the right place. Honestly, it's not for everyone. There is a real knack to it. And I really do love it. Film's a bit different. It's a bit slower. And I love it all. I really do. I love it all. But I do think that it's important to put yourself through the trauma of doing live (laughs) theatre. Because it's nerve-wracking. But I I also think it's a real opportunity for exploration and and growth. And honestly, I don't even apologise anymore if that sounds wanky because... I love what I do. I love the craft of acting. I've got so much still to learn. And I think you can learn so much. Some of the theatre people I've worked with, theatre directors, including the Royal Lyceum in Edinburgh or the Sits in Glasgow, or as talented as anybody I've worked with in Los Angeles, you know, talent's universal and you just want to work with good people, wherever you are. It's no yeah. small jobs, only small actors, that kind of adage. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 And certainly looking at your IMDb page, you're no stranger to doing anything. It seems you give everything a go. You've done a bit of voiceover work, taking on the role of Merida for video games. I didn't actually realise that until I looked it up, but there it was. Yeah, I got the job to voice match Kelly McDonald, who's like, she's from 20 minutes away from us, right? And <laughs> yeah. and from her age and everything. And that was a big deal for me in my first year in LA because that was a legit job with a contract with Disney with my name on it, that meant I was going to be able to pay my rent through using my craft. And that was a real big deal. And what a fun character. And I wish they needed me. They didn't need me to do pickups for the movie or anything. That's the one thing I wish. But I mean, apart from that, it's the gift that keeps on giving. I've done so many little bits and pieces as Merida. And just what fun. And like, how amazing to kind of be able to say, I'm sort of, I'm a Disney princess. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? It's kind of cool, right? It's kind of cool. And Lego, no less. So that's that's something. Yeah, yeah, Lego. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> My voice is mixed in, I think, with Angelina Jolie's voice in the Lego game. Yeah, can't complain. <laughs> and what is doing voice work for video games like? I've spoken to a lot of voice actors and they talk about how sometimes you just have to imagine what the other person is saying or sometimes you're just recording 50 lines that might get used as reactions to something else and things like yeah. that. Again, it's a real test. I think voice actors, they do all the time. You know, that's their bread and butter. It's a real skill. And what I find with the microphone, I go in, often as Merida, like I stand up, I'm standing at the mic, I'm doing a lot of the physicality as much as I can to make it as alive as it possibly can. Because what the microphone does, I think, is it picks up any dead energy. You've got to be so energised and so alive to have that energy come through the mic when there's no visual. And so for me doing Merida, I'm standing in in a little booth in Burbank, again, with sometimes great directors, people who really can just say one thing to you and it changes the whole direction of one little tiny phrase. And you might do it three times in a row or six times in a row till they get the exact phrase you know the exact way that you're to say those three words the way they want them that sound alive and vibrant and you know they're telling a story without seeing anything and it's a real yeah it's really fun and really challenging and really tiring and fab and I'd love to do more I really would I'd love to do more yeah video game acting seems to be a big thing at the moment I've seen a lot of behind the scenes stuff where they do the whole motion capture thing so it is like you're actually filming a film but you're saying the lines at the same time and you kind of just have to imagine everything that's happening around you, but you've got all the motion tracking dots on you and things. It just seems like a really cool way to do something. It does. I think the one thing, and this is not to be too like, I mean, it's industry talk, but the way you get paid for them is when I see these video games, they're amazing nowadays. They are so lifelike. I mean, the graphics and everything, I mean, they're, they're lifelike. They're like watching amazing movies and there's emotion and drama and everything in them. And they make more money than the movies often. And sometimes they come first. But the way that you get paid for them, our union saga here, it's not quite worked out yet. 
And I think, you know, you get rewarded if you do a film, a big film that does well, you do get rewarded. And as actors, you rely on the odd job here and there that rewards you very well to sustain you financially through all the fallow times. Yeah. When you're doing things for free or you're getting paid very little for doing a piece of theatre or or whatever it is. So, yeah, it's still, I think sometimes people think, oh, you've arrived or you've landed because you've been in a show in America. And it's like, no, you know, you still got to work out how to pay the bills. And I think I'm quite grateful for my Scottish upbringing and my pragmatism. And my dad always would say, you know, you keep your feet in the ground you keep your feet in the ground. <laughs> and I think that actually serves quite a lot of people well that come out to Hollywood, feel quite fortunate. And I didn't ever realise how Scottish I was till I got here. <laughs> grateful for it. Very grateful. <laughs> so with Supernatural, that's obviously the thing that people will know you for the most. Long running show. It's ran for a couple of years, just a couple of years, been uh-huh. on for a little while. Has a little bit of a following. So how did that all come about? How did you get into that show and over to Vancouver to do all the filming and all that stuff. Yeah, that was a really, uh, two weeks ago, or maybe it's coming up for three weeks ago, Jared and Jensen had their last day's filming and there was an email chain from like the producers, including Eric Kripke. And gosh, it was so emotional. And I spent the day bawling my eyes out because it was (laughs) six years of my life and it's changed my life in every way. And just, gosh, what a journey it's been. And it really felt genuinely like a piece of fate as Merida would say, maybe it's your feet. I felt like a piece of feet the whole way that the thing happened because I'd had a really, you know, I always worked hard. I'd always felt I had something to offer. I think that's the thing as an actor, you can't compare yourself to other people. You have to kind of go, there's a space for me somehow, but I, I wasn't really finding my space. And I really hadn't had a TV audition out here in two years. I had a really hard year personally. Lots of things had gone wrong in every dimension of my life. And so 2014 it felt a bit like starting from scratch again. And then one of my dear friends, Hen, sent me this breakdown of this mysterious, possibly Scottish character, this woman from another time. And I just, there was something about it. I just thought I have to do every single thing possible to be seen for this job. And I got into my agents, I got into a Canadian casting director, I put together a clip reel. And at the end of the day, I don't quite know how, but the casting director, Robert Ulrich, who runs UDK, and they cast things like Glee, you know, and quite big shows. He saw me, he read me, which is so hard nowadays to get a casting director, quite a big casting director, just to get you in to read you when they don't know you, to meet you. And I watched, I think, 14 episodes of Supernatural that weekend. Luckily, I had a weekend to prepare. And uh, I watched as many episodes. I treated the script like it was Tennessee Williams. You know, I took such good care of it and went in and met him. Luckily, he read me. His wife's an actress, so I think he understands theatre series maybe more than other TV casting directors out here. So I went in and I could just see, as we were reading, like he was trying to grab a post-it note. And he's like, you're Ruth, right? (laughs) (laughs) And then the next day I was in front of the producers. And then the next day I had the job. Like, that's a long story short, but it it was like one of those things where you just, you know, it's like the hand goes in the glove and it's just the right fit. And then it was a case of booked for one episode, potentially maybe another couple. And there was no way of knowing it would turn into 12. I think I did 12 episodes in my first season which is essentially a series regular in my first season and then became one of the longest running female characters I've ever had. And yeah, and and I think that one of the most invited female characters to conventions and it turned into this amazing journey where I got to do amazing stuff that the writers gave me. I'm so grateful to the writers and the producers and the directors of the show and all the fans. Yeah, it's been such an amazing journey and I'm, I'm, I'm waffling on just now because it is quite a nostalgic time right now <laughs> yeah. for saying goodbye to it a little bit um, yeah another eight weeks and then it's over or something like that as of this week yeah I mean I think I mean the conventions and stuff hopefully we can do that again right with COVID I think there'll be reunion stuff for a while to come I hope oh yeah I don't think that'll fade I mean the fan base is as loyal as it gets I think mm-hmm. they'll always be clamouring for more. Obviously, there were two attempts at spin-off that never happened. Yeah, I don't uh, think it's going to fade away. Not a chance. Not after 15 years on the air. No, and I think because I did that there's a spin-off of The Boys now happening. I yeah. think after that. And there's lots of offshoots, I think, possible still. And yeah, as long as there, they have, there's television and there's reruns. Yeah. 
Are you just going to keep reminding Eric Kripke that you're around every time these kind of spin off ideas show up? Yeah, and that's really how I hope, and I do think this business does work. You know, sometimes you need a kind of real magical break like the one I got. But often it's people who you've worked with before, they trust you to be on a set and how to handle yourself and the work you'll do. And it really is a case of, it's not who you know, like so for some people it is, like if you're very connected or I don't know, but it really is who you work with well and hopefully those relationships keep panning out. I, I do think that the human element is really important and everything that we do is a bit like politics, let's not go there. <laughs> yeah, let's not touch that. With Supernatural being a CW show as well, I get the impression that that's a network that likes to reuse actors because... I watch a lot of CW shows with all the superhero ones, etc. And it's like, oh, it's that guy. He was in that thing I saw two weeks ago or whatever. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because the week before I got the audition in 2014, I literally said out loud, I think maybe to my friend Hen, I said to her, you know, I just, because I hadn't had a TV audition here for a couple of years and a lot of the TV here just looks so glossy. And I kind of said to her, you know, I just have to accept that I'm just not like a network TV actress. I just don't look like a network TV actress, which I don't necessarily think I do. But the universe obviously had a laugh in my favour, not at my expense. I mean, it's hilarious to me in a way that I'm on the CW because people are so young and glamorous on the CW. <laughs> Here I am, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> So with the Rowena role, you said you were booked for one, maybe two episodes. Was it always like that? Or did it get to a point where it's like, we're keeping you around for a while? We'll let you know when we're getting rid of you. I got to the stage. I had a guarantee of a number of episodes and different things. And then the showrunners change, things move. I've died a couple of times, but I was never told, oh, you're gone, gone. I felt like I had done really well out of the show. I think, I don't know if I've got 34 episodes, something like that, which is a lot for Supernatural. And I always just felt very supported. And even in the last season, I you know, had a message from one of the writers. And honestly, people from the network talking to me about how excited they were about where the character was going. And we do care about the character. I think Rowena was taken care of and it was important in the time and space that we're in now in the world that this woman was given an arc and a through line and a position. I think that's important for people to see. I think we're more and more aware of how important representation is and the stories that we're telling. So I'm super grateful. I love Rowena. And I'm super happy for her. <laughs> I'm super happy to get to play it, if that all makes sense. Yeah. Especially on a show that is so male-dominated, two male leads that persist through. And then you have Castiel and Bobby. They were prominent as well throughout. So as you say, the female characters, there was hardly any of them. And then the ones that there were didn't kind of stick around that long. So mm-hmm. it is monumental in that sense that Rowena is around for as long as she was. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And I'm super grateful to the writers. And I count them amongst my friends. I love writers. The joke in Hollywood is, right, you got a terrible part in something, like a really rubbish part, and they say, well, who did you sleep with? The writer. (laughs) Because they used to not have any power. That's maybe changing because so many showrunners now are writer showrunners. It's different depending on the show that you're on and how shows get made. And it's also slightly different, I think, in America maybe than in Europe. But I love writers somebody that can sit down with an empty page and create a world and bring things to life to me it's just gold it's absolute gold dust and I did some classes with Larry Moss who's a really fantastic teacher out here and he says as long as the human race keeps going actors will be performing works by writers who are so long dead but their words will keep on living and I, I just I love writers kind of the most and I sort of wish I had that ability in myself a bit more I'm trying. That's something I'm trying to do. I'm I'm trying to write something. Cool. It has been said that TV is a writer's medium. It became one sort of a few years ago when I guess a lot of writers moved away from films because they weren't getting that freedom. And then TV was just offering that freedom. And then actors Mm -hmm. go with them because that's where all the good stuff is happening kind of thing. So absolutely. Golden golden era. Yeah. 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 So what was it like playing Mark Shepard's mother? Because obviously he was an established presence on the show by the time you came on and then there was that big reveal that his mother was still kicking around that no one kind of expected at the time what was all that like oh mark and i have a lot of love for each other i hope Um, (laughs) i know know we do and his wife sarah and isabella and you know his kids they're will and max and his mum even i sometimes go out for tea with his mum mark is a real character in himself He's one of the most naturally talented actors I've ever come across. You know, he really has just that 
innate ability. He didn't go to drama school. He just kind of did it. And he's also a handful. But somehow our chemistry worked. But he didn't want me to be his mother. But the very fact that I was playing his mother and that annoyed him to me was perfect because I'm just supposed to annoy him. You know, I'm supposed to be annoying. I'm supposed to be a thorn in his side. And I was brought in to give his character more development, I believe. And then both were allowed to develop even further. And it's interesting how those chemistries work out. And I just also get on so well with Misha. Misha is just an incredible person. And, and Jared and Jensen too. And just, and honestly, Alex Calvert, I don't know if you're up to date in the show. Yeah, love very up to date. I love Alex. And Lisa Berry I worked with on the show. I adore Lisa. We talk quite often. But some of my best friends from the show are people who I've not filmed with. People like Elena, Sam Smith, Felicia and I filmed a bit. And Kim, keeping in touch with these people, getting to know people because of the conventions has been amazing too. And Pellegrino and Rob and Rich and gosh, the list just goes on and on. The mats, but you know, there's the, the fun, fun people that I've got to meet and become like a kind of part of this family with has been amazing for a, a girl from 5,000 miles away. Really incredible. And a good chunk of your work on the show was spent with Sam. So you and Jared were working yeah. together more than you would with Jensen, at least on camera. So was yeah. that based on how you bounced off each other and the writers noticed it, or was it kind of just. Yeah, it yeah, it's to do with the similarity in the storyline. We both had gone through a similar thing. And I think what the writers pick up on is if Jared and Jensen are against working with somebody or not. <laughs> you know, Jensen and I had, uh, had some lovely moments too in regarding Dean and stuff. And Jensen and I worked together. He directed me in my first episode and directed me in another episode. And I, we have that relationship. When I was doing Michael, I said to him on set, you know, if you've got any notes, tell me, which is not a thing actors really often do. But I take it from Jensen. I think he's... Terrific. And, and Jared, the rupture episode, he's so committed and really turned up for me because I, I think they know how much I, I try to turn up for them. And Misha too. Misha's gone out of his way off set, especially. We've not worked together so much on set. I created this thing in my head about Rowena wanting to kind of pull Castiel's wings off and sort of really <laughs> enjoying it. And just, yeah, so many fun dynamics that all the relationships were different, but fun. And then kind of being allowed to be Jack's anti Rowena. Yeah. <laughs> to have, be a little bit maternal towards him was really fun too yeah obviously the thing with Jared the two, these two characters have gone through a trauma together a similar trauma and I thought he yeah, played a blinder in the rupture yeah and also the knowing that he was supposed to kill Rowena as well that was an interesting dynamic for a while <laughs> yeah that he was conflicted about it that he cared <laughs> yeah how far it came from, we really want to kill this person to, I actually don't want to kill this person. I think Dean was always a bit more trigger happy <laughs> for Rowena, but still there's a respect there, I think. Which yeah. I love. When I spoke to Farah, she talked about how welcoming they were. Obviously she was only on one episode, well, two episodes, but one episode substantially. And she talked about how welcoming they were and how they helped her through her scenes as well. So it does seem to be one of those sets that no one has shunned, which is great to hear. Yeah, and Farah I met at the convention in Vancouver and she's a, such a good photographer as well as an actor and she's just so effervescent herself and she's friends with so many of us now too and the thing is if you've got like a kind of yes attitude and a can-do attitude and you want to get involved, people are welcome and welcomed. So I've done a few shoots with Farah since then and she definitely feels very much a part of it. Um, yeah. It happens with some, like Tim Omanson, God, goodness, you know, such a part of it. And you look at how many episodes and you're like, wow, these characters made that much of an impact in this many episodes. It's incredible, really. And some of my favourite moments from Rowena were your back and forth with Richard Spate Jr. when he was playing Gabriel. I thought those were excellent. In the stacks. I didn't know what that meant. Do you say <laughs> in the stacks in Edinburgh and Falkirk, do you say that, meaning the library? Yeah. You do? I, I never heard that phrase in the snacks. <laughs> no? No, never. Honestly, I learn something new every day and often it get away with stuff. I'm like, oh, I don't know that. We don't say that in Scotland. But I think eventually some people are like, really? <laughs> like all these things? And I just know it's just a roof thing that she didn't, like I didn't know. Uh, I don't know where it came from, but yeah, I definitely heard it. I don't think it's very commonly said, but. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Maybe more commonly used over here. <laughs> it was fun. And Phil Sugrisha directed that episode. Phil's on the boys now. He's a real mentor as well. You call him Uncle Phil. And <laughs> he's been on the show for so long. And at that point when he's working with Rich and I in those scenes, he's able to really 
workers and really direct us. We could push us and get who we wants and improvise quite a lot of it. And there was a rumour of a master take where they were going to put together because the scene is quite a bit longer and there was so much footage that we did that day in those scenes and there was rumour but it's never come through never say never (laughs) one of these days yeah Yeah, because I think the fans would really like it yeah he seems like quite a funny guy certainly had a lot of the best comedic moments on the show whenever he appeared so that must have been a blast he's hilarious he's incredibly witty and I have to say, the people around, there's no slouches. That's the thing about it. You're surrounded by smart people. They're pretty fast thinking and, yeah, a lot of quips and a lot of humour on set. And I, I really enjoyed it. And I have to say that as a woman often surrounded by five or six tall men, I always felt very safe and respected. And that doesn't always happen, right, in Hollywood? No, or- as has been widely publicised and rightly so these days. Mm-hmm. So was there any major pranks played on you by anyone while you were filming? Uh, yeah, there was. There was. Yeah. And I like I tried to get my own back a couple <laughs> of times, but it took me about, I don't know, 25 episodes in to find, you know, I, I'm just trying so hard to do my job professionally and not get fired. You know, and television time is money. And so never wanting to do it at the wrong time or piss people off or slow things down too much. So it took me maybe four seasons to attempt my first prank. Back what at was the it? Very game. I'll see. Some, some, some things you just got to leave on set. Some, some <laughs> to, to, to stay on set. But I have to tell you, that's the number one question we get asked at conventions. And yeah. we, we need to think about maybe if we get 50 pence every time somebody asks us that. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth a try. Yeah, it was. God loves a try. Bottles of whiskey or something. <laughs> So maybe not so much pranks then. What are your favourite moments, either on set or off set, of being on Supernatural? What were some of the highlights? I love travelling to go on to set. I love being driven in the car. It's not because you're fancy, they just don't trust you to get <laughs> on, especially in Vancouver. So you, know, you get driven. At four in the morning or some nonsense time like that. Often, yeah, definitely. And especially because Rowena was so glamorous. They were so long in what they call the works, hair and makeup. So I'd be there very early. And I loved being in the works in the makeup and hair trailer with Trish and Jen or whoever was working on me. And I would love Emma, who would go and get me an omelette from, from Crafty. <laughs> I just Honestly, I love the whole rigmarole. You know, and then Moira coming and helping me get changed, because you know, you've got to get mics on and stuff like that. And walking on set, saying hello to everyone, that you get to know the Canadian crew so well. And they've been on the show longer than I have. And getting to play this fun character there has just been so many moments and I honestly I, I genuinely hand in my heart can say that I really savored most of it you know you, you're still human you know you forget and you get involved in what's not going right in your world or what you're annoyed about but um, I just I, I relish so much of it and so many fun moments just getting to do what Rowena was getting to do it's really fun to do those things that she got to do I do remember one episode, they cleared one of the streets in Vancouver. There's a street in Vancouver, there's a lot of restaurants you go to dinner on. I don't know if they're open right now, COVID. Yeah. but anyway, this beautiful cobbled street in Vancouver and I turned up in the morning, they drove me from the works to put my full costume here, makeup and everything. It's a drizzly Vancouver day and I hadn't quite realised, but they cleared the whole street and I had this street where Rowena had to walk down with her carpet bags like she was leaving. Maybe it was Inside Man was the episode. And so just getting to walk down this deserted Vancouver street with a film crew behind you and a, a big crane, which is a really expensive piece of equipment. I felt like I was in a movie. One of those moments <laughs> you like, I, I get to do this. Some amazing moments like that. And then obviously some gorgeous, fun moments sitting in baby with the boys. We'd often sit inside the car waiting to film to keep warm while we're on the street and I often used to say to Jensen because he would drive to shot or whatever and I'd be like are you sure you need to rev it as much as that you know? <laughs> is the car as comfy as it looks it's not comfortable at all no it's not I'm sorry maybe I should keep the mystery alive or whatever. <laughs> really hard it's like I mean no that back seat and no and then one time getting out of it I'm in handcuffs I've got five inch heels on a long evening gown I mean it's a recipe for disaster. And then Jared trying to hurry me out and like I smack my head off the, you know, the top of the window trying to get out of the car. <laughs> I mean, baby's awesome, but she's definitely a dude's car. Yeah. Uh, or something a little more luxurious, maybe a Mercedes or something for me, I think. Yeah, the, 
ironically not the best car to drive for hundreds of miles in, even though that's kind of all they do. I know the back seat more than the front two seats, so I'm just going to say that in the back, they've not thought about their passengers as much as they could have had a wee rug. They had a wee tartan rug in the back. (laughs) There's a bit of insider knowledge on what's it like to sit in the car. People will love that. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I recommend it and they have, they have copies of the car at the conventions and stuff and yeah it's fun it's definitely a character in the show yeah well, there was a whole episode about it from that perspective which was amazing yeah that was a great episode yeah was it Tom Wright directed that episode I'm not sure well, yeah I remember it well though I remember thinking oh it's good that after so many years they can still give us something fresh like this it's yeah an achievement for a show that runs that long to give you something that's very new reinventing the wheel yeah Literally, in that case. (laughs) So was there anything you wanted for Rowena that you didn't get to do, but really, really wanted for her? I love where she ended up. I thought I got to play a lot of things, for sure. I would like to have seen, and obviously it's not finished sharing yet, but like I'd like to have seen more of how she ruled. But I think the story goes on. Even when the show ends, the story somehow still goes on somehow and also never say never I don't have any like regrets or unfulfilled wishes because I do think they took care of her in the end I think they really took care of her for a little while I felt like she sort of didn't have a strong of a purpose like she was a little bit lost she wasn't into the making the mega coven anymore and her son was gone and she's gone through a lot of different phases Rowena and I'm so, so lucky that there were so many different elements to look at yeah, and you're always sort of catching her mid-project as well. They bump into her when she's in the middle of, of course, some figuring project. out her next thing or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and it was like partly Bob Behrens and I talked about this. She's kind of like a cat. She's not like this megalomaniacal woman, really. She gets this power. She sort of doesn't know what to do with it sometimes. She gets in trouble and she gets caught. And she's like a cat with nine lives, but you're not sure if she's used up six or seven. Where she's at, she's a bit of a lost soul in a way, I think a little bit too, as well as being a sole survivor. She's strong, but I think she can't quite leave the boys alone because she doesn't have that many people to play with that are her own size, (laughs) experience-wise or smartness-wise or whatnot. So she needed the Winchesters in the end, for sure. So what's next for yourself? What's your next project or what are you lining up or what are you trying to prepare for? I've got a really great manager in Los Angeles now, Luke, and a really great agent in London called Jonathan. And it's first time in a long time that I felt well represented in a way that means I'll get auditions and get seen for things. And that might be surprising to people if anybody's still listening to me waffling on, that it's not been that easy as a woman who's not perceived. Like, I don't see it this way, but like Hollywood young, you know, like, gosh, I just sort of don't don't even want to give it much airspace saying that kind of negative stuff. But I've seen myself really struggle to get representation where I've seen maybe guys the same age as me not and so I'm really grateful now that I've got these two terrific people looking out for me for theatrical like I've got great voiceover and great convention you know I'm really happy so I'm I'm actually quite optimistic that there are some opportunities that I'll get seen for and it's maybe surprising to people that you know you're on a show to hear that it's not easy to get auditions for things. It's just so competitive. There's so many people and it is about who you know casting director wise and who can get you in. So your representation is important. So yeah, I've had a couple of auditions and I'm optimistic. I know that there'll be little things I can do. I'm pretty sure about that, but I'm optimistic there's something maybe bigger I can do. I hope for another journey, another experience where I get to really expand a character and I'd love to do that again on just on something else in a different way. Uh, that's what I'd love to do. So keep your fingers crossed for me. Yeah, maybe we'll see you season three or four of The Boys. Who knows? Oh, <laughs> never know. Because fans do love the, oh, look, it's a Kripke alum showing up on another show. And, you know, they Absolutely. do love that. Feel free getting... to go out to the producers and tell them that. Well, if they'll ever listen to me, I will happily sing your praises. That won't be a problem. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's been great. I wouldn't take up much more of your time but it's been a really great chat it's been really great having you on and I'm eternally grateful for Farah for putting us in touch because mm. I've really wanted to talk to you since you've been on the show and so it's been amazing to oh, when you said you're from Falkirk I was like it's that's hard to say no to <laughs> yeah well when I read that online when I was looking at it, I was like I can't believe that how <laughs> I can't believe there's someone from Falkirk in a show that I like what's going on here did you used to go to Rosie O'Grady's I don't know how old you are like 
I'm 33. Younger than me, so um, I don't know if that was still around. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't ring a bell, certainly. But I would go to places like Behind the Wall. Oh, Behind the Wall. It's been there forever. (laughs) Absolutely. So I still go there sometimes for a little text mix. I went there for dinner two years ago. That was the last time I was there. But yeah, it's good food. Yeah, no, it's great. I've been Mm. there for such a long time. And yeah, it used to be a place I'd be a bit intimidated to go into Behind the Wall. You know, I'd be a bit scared to go in there. (laughs) Because yeah. when you're here, you know. Um, <laughs> and when I was perhaps slightly too young to be in the place, used to go to a place, Furkins. Furkins I think that was, yeah. Furkins. yeah, yeah. When you're under 18, they don't check ID. That was that was what was known at the time. Furkins. We used to go to the Maniki. Um, it doesn't exist any longer, I don't think. But where was the pub? There was a drink, an old drinking man's pub that the boys from my school would go to. And it was just, I mean, you used to go and drink pints of heavy. And I'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> I wish I could remember the name, but the name's gone out of my head. Maybe uh, Smith's. I don't know. That was the place I used to go to because it was a proper old man pub. I've always loved an old man pub. I've always been an old man. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. I call myself Granny out here. So, because <laughs> I drink yeah. tea and stuff and I call myself Granny. So, yeah, I found myself in the manicure a few times and always regretted it. Yeah. Come on, Eileen. Yeah. <laughs> that place never changed until they shut it. That was. <laughs> God. Yeah, I bet you don't get to reminisce about that very often. <laughs> Not very often. But as I said, some of my best friends from then and my friend Diane and Roisin and Michelle and people like that. Like my dad it was involved in football as well and I still meet people in Falkirk and they're like, Your dad's Davy Connell <laughs> and, you know, and I love that. I miss it. Yeah. Yeah. Home is home. It'll always be home. Yeah. yeah. Even if you wanted out of it, but <laughs> Yeah. So just last question. We always ask this because we deal with a lot of superhero stuff on this. So if you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? I'd like to be able to freeze time. Oh, nice. Um, I haven't had that one before, I don't think. It really, it was a daydream I used to have when I was younger. That I could freeze the high street in Falkirk and just walk about it mm. and maybe go into whatever shop I wanted and come out and nothing, like it was just time was frozen, but I could still move around and do what I wanted to do. I usually have that thought when I wake up for work and think, I wish I could freeze time right now so I could sleep. Probably, yeah, I probably something to do with shopping, probably something else. <laughs> anyway, it was yeah. lovely speaking to you, Craig. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for agreeing to appear and it's been a pleasure and good luck with your future stuff. I'll certainly be keeping an eye out and it's been great seeing you on Supernatural all these years. You've been a great fixture on the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Okay. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that was my chat with Supernatural Ruth Connell. I wish her the very best for her future projects and hope that she's successful in whatever she does. If you like what you heard, then you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or any major podcasting app. If you want to talk Supernatural or anything else, then you can find us on Facebook or Twitter under Neil Before Blog, or leave comments on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. As always... We hope you'll join us next time on Meal Before Pod.